welcome to the Colcast, the nethermost podcast in the world. Thank you for tuning into this podcast series where we throughout eight episodes will give you an insight to the exciting research that goes on at the University Centre in Svalbard or UNIS as we like to call it. You'll meet professors and students who are passionate about their cold climate research and learn more about the Arctic both as a field of study but also as a place people call home. My name is Maria Filippa Rossi and I'm your host today. In this episode, we are joined by Lucas Frank. Lucas first came to Svalbard in 2017 as a bachelor student, then returned to do a master and is now working on a PhD on regional interaction between atmosphere, ocean and ice. And we'll get a bit into that reaction interaction between atmosphere, ocean and ice a bit later. But you have also been involved in a project called IWIN, East Fjorden Weather Information Network. And that's where I want to start because Norwegians, we love uh, talking about the weather and uh, it's the best uh, small talk uh, topic that you can have. Um, and, and also because we have so much weather in Norway, there's generally a lot to, to talk about. And, and often the forecasting of it and the accuracy of it is also often a great conversation starter. So so maybe we should just start there, Luke, is why is weather forecasting so challenging is in Svalbard? Yeah, um, first of all, thanks for having me. This is a really cool opportunity to tell the people all over the world a little bit of what we're doing here and uh, what I'm working on. Um, yes, uh, weather forecasting in Svalbard is uh, in general more complicated than uh, in other parts uh, of the world. Um, and we see that uh, forecasts typically also are worse compared to, for example, mainland Norway. There is uh, three main reasons for that, and all of them are in a way related to what a numerical weather prediction model actually is, how it works to forecast weather. Um, so maybe we should talk about the architecture of a of a model first and what it actually does. Yes, please explain. <laughs> In the end, uh, a numerical weather prediction model is a set of equations based on basic physical principles that are known for a long time and that are quite well understood. So we're talking about the uh, conservation of momentum, mass and energy in the end. So when we when we think about wind, then this is uh, overall the conservation of of momentum. When we think about temperature, then that's the conservation of energy and uh, the conservation of mass, um, well, nothing can uh, get lost and nothing can be added to the system. So in the end, these three main principles uh, have to be fulfilled when we when we try to uh, simulate flow in the atmosphere. And uh, every model, no matter um, what it uh, is specifically uh, targeted for, it's based on these equations. Um, so this is basically just a, a big computer that uh, tries to solve these equations um, for a certain region, maybe for the whole uh, for the whole globe. And um, in order for the model to to simulate the Earth, it has to basically generate a simplified version. Uh, we call it a grid. So uh, a grid basically. Um, it looks like a, a net, a fisher net um, that spans all over um, the uh, the domain of the model. And at every grid point, at every point, um, the model calculates temperature, humidity, wind speed, wind direction, um, based on these basic equations that I that I mentioned earlier. Um, we are currently at the at the stage that global models have a, a grid spacing of uh, order of ten to fifteen kilometers. Um, so all over the world, uh, every ten kilometers, there is one of these grid points where we can uh, calculate the, the atmospheric variables. And it's it's not a physical point. It's a it's just in the model. Yes, yeah. it's for the model. The model uh, picks these locations basically, um, and. Uh, for the model, the world is uh, on scales of these 10 kilometers um, for, for global models. Um, and we are also uh, not only talking about uh, one layer uh, close to the surface, but uh, we basically uh, stack these grids in, in several vertical levels so that we also get information from uh, higher uh, altitudes in, in the atmosphere. So in total for for um, nowadays models, global models, we're talking about several hundred millions of grid points. And at each of these grid points, again, uh, the model solves these numerical equations to calculate temperature and humidity and to forecast um, into the future. 
So uh, you can imagine that this is a a huge uh, job uh, even for for modern computers. So um, this uh, this requires a lot of computational power, and in the end, the the largest uh, high performance computing that that we currently have available is is used for these uh, for these jobs. And um, this this model uh, grids this is um, the first challenge that that we face up here in the Arctic, because um, when you think of uh, scales of of ten to fifteen kilometers. Um, when when you when you look at the uh, topography here in Svalbard, things change a lot uh, within ten kilometers. Uh, thinking about glaciers, thinking about just the terrain itself, the topography, mountainous areas intersected by small valleys. So within ten kilometers, we actually see a lot of variability in the real world mm. that the model just can't resolve because the model sees the world on its grid points, so on scales of 10 kilometers maybe. Mm. So that's the first challenge uh, in in regions where topography changes dramatically, that um, we need higher resolution basically to resolve the small scales that, that we have in the real world. And therefore we, um, we apply regional models. So we use a global model as input and the boundaries, um, but then have a high resolution focus on a specific area to try to resolve more of these small scale features. But again, you can imagine resolving more, meaning a denser grid. For example, for Svalbard, our operational model at the moment is a 2.5 kilometer model. Um, but that means also that we uh, we have more grid points again. So even though we cut out the smaller region, which reduces the total number of grid points, then we resolve more by higher grid density, which adds more grid points again. So we again run into the same issue that at some point we don't have enough computational power to resolve more and more and we are limited. And uh, that that will always be an issue in regions where topography um, presents challenges just because it changes so much over such small scales. And um, then there is always processes that are smaller than these grid scales, no matter how small you can resolve and no matter how, how fast your computer gets, at some point you will reach scales that you can't resolve anymore. Think, for example, of uh, cloud physics, where we talk about microscopic small droplets inside the clouds. Think about uh, turbulence in the close to the surface, so small eddies of, of winds. Um, these processes, they can't be resolved in, in weather prediction models. And therefore, um, we have to somehow estimate their effect on the general circulation, on the general atmospheric conditions what 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 does the the cloud microphysics have an effect on the large scale situation for example we we look at the small droplets but then the effect is that if there is a cloud the sun gets shielded and can't heat the surface for example mm. and uh, these uh, subscript scale processes we call parameterization so this is additional equations that have to be added to the model to estimate these effects of small scale processes onto the grid variables on our model grid. And uh, that's uh, the second challenge basically that we face up here in the Arctic, that um, we don't understand the processes well enough uh, to develop good parameterizations. One reason is of course, we don't have uh, lots of experimental observations to actually understand them, to measure them. It's really hard to um, to get observations uh, here in, in the Arctic in remote areas. Uh, we will probably come back to that later. Uh, but uh, that, that, that limits us. That is uh, compared to the mid-latitudes where experimental setups are a lot easier to, to handle. We have a lot more data to base these parameterizations on. So... Um, up here, we, we still really struggle to, to parameterize these small scale processes. And then on top of that, we have some unique processes that only happen up here in the Arctic. Think uh, especially uh, air sea ice interaction processes. We don't have sea ice uh, in lo most parts of the world. So this is something very special up here that we have to additionally add into our models. Also clouds is a big, uh, big problem in a sense that 
we have uh, clouds that are called uh, mixed phase clouds up here, meaning that it's uh, both water droplets, but also ice crystals uh, in the same cloud, basically next to each other. And it's really difficult to figure out the properties of these clouds and to uh, estimate their effect then. So there, there's a lot of uncertainty in these parameterizations in, uh, in the Arctic. And that's uh, the second challenge for weather forecasting up here. And then um, in the end, of course, if we want to uh, forecast weather into the future, then we first need to know how the weather is now so mm. that we can calculate, that we can start our model. We need some initial conditions. So we need some measurements as a starting point. And uh, then we're back to this problem that uh, here in the Arctic, it's really difficult and uh, really hard to actually get some measurements to get some initial conditions, um, both thinking that there is so few people living here, which means there's also so few observations and they are distributed over a huge area. Um, so we, we have large uncertainties in our actual initial conditions. We only have a few points that we can use horizontally um, and it gets even worth, worth, it gets even worse thinking about the vertical because uh, in the mainland we would, for example, have uh, radio soundings, balloons, we would have uh, aircrafts uh, that measure during their landing to airports, for example, vertical profiles through the atmosphere. All of that is, is very sparse uh, up here in Svalbard. We have one flight a day, basically, to the airport, two flights maybe. And we have one radio sounding in New Olesund, and the next one is in Björnøya, which is several hundred kilometers away. And that's the only input that we that we basically have or that the models can use as initial conditions to start a forecast. So um, we we lack we lack good observations in the first place to start model runs, and that's the third challenge: uh, the sparse observational network uh, that we that we have here in the Arctic. And all these three points together then uh, often lead to uh, times when the forecast says sun, and we are um, yeah sitting inside and. Uh, waiting for the storm to pass. Yeah, <laughs> that is uh, that was a very comprehensive and, and, and good explanation. Thank you for that. I mentioned the IWIN project initially, and, and there you are actually trying to do something about this, especially the current observations. Can you explain a bit about that? Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, up here at Eunice, we are, we are very few people also working here, and uh, we are limited in our resources. We We can't really help in the in the model development that's the job for the for the big uh, w national weather services in in oslo med norway for example uh, the european center in in reading um but what what Eunice is good at and what what we what we are here for is field work we, we can go out we can provide the measurements uh, to give better initial conditions for, for model runs, but also to validate the models to check actually how good is it and uh, what is good, what is bad, under which condition does the model perform good and under which does it perform bad. Um, so this is, this is one contribution that we uh, work here at UNIS on uh, insta installing weather stations, small scale weather stations in the area to investigate these small scale processes that I talked about to validate the model. Um, and it's, it's our goal to, to have a, a network that um, we can, we can use for all of these things together, basically. And uh, I win the, the Eastfjorden weather information network, as we call it. It's a, it's a setup where we have combined uh, additional lighthouse stations, we call them. So uh, on top of the uh, reference stations from at Norway that are in the area, we've installed some small weather stations on lighthouses around the fjord, covering uh, a large area in that sense, and giving us additional fixed location measurements on, on top of uh, what Met Norway uses for their, for their model uh, initialization. And then uh, we have the unique opportunity that over summer we have uh, some uh, small tourist cruise boats in the area that go on very regular treks every day to the neighboring uh, towns here in, in Eastfjorden. 
And we have equipped these boats with the uh, weather stations as well, which gives us insights from the uh, near surface conditions over the fjord. Uh, we would usually never have the, the option to install instruments uh, in the middle of the fjord. Mm -hmm. So um, this gives an, an additional uh, input for, for our understanding of the processes that happen between the, uh, the coast and the fjord, the interaction between the atmosphere and the ocean. Um, so this is uh, this is a quite unique and, and new setup that we are working on to understand these small scale processes better here in, in East Fjorden. Those are weather stations that the public can check as well. You can go in and actually see what, what are the conditions there right now and then use it to, to plan your your day trip out or Absolutely. Um, this was one of our, our goals also, um, because we know that the weather forecast isn't too great. So <laughs> it, it's very valuable to actually check the real time conditions before you, before you want to head out on a trip. So, um, this, this data is, uh, is transferred directly via the uh, 4G network. Uh, so cell phone network. And, um, within five minutes, basically after real time, we have this data available on, on servers and, uh, shared online that everybody, um, can, can use to, to plan their trips, uh, before going out, have a quick look. How is the weather actually where I want to go? Mm. How is the information shared or used internationally? You mentioned Met Norway that they sort of look after the models, but who, who develops it in the first place and how is it done? So, um, in, in principle, the, uh, like the, the big national weather services of, of like the U S Germany, uh, UK, they, uh, they run global models and of course also develop these models, um, produce new forecasts every three hour, typically, uh, new runs every three hours. And, uh, the smaller countries often apply regional models, uh, for their area and use the global models then as input it's it's really expensive both money wise but also computational power wise to run these global models so there exists only two handful of, of global models mm -hmm. but then lots of of regional models that focus on on the specific areas and every every model in its core is is basically the same it's all again just this this core set of equations that that's mainly the same for for every model the differences in the different models uh, are mainly in the parameterizations in how these subgrid subgrid scale processes are, are treated in the different models and there every uh, national weather service has probably different uh, foci different um, belief also in in how things are working what but um, I mean, we, we don't understand all of it. So to some extent, this is uh, also up to uh, to discussion between the, the different institutes and, and weather services. And, and everybody tries to, um, to find the best way to solve this problem. How about the, the polar night or the midnight sun? Does that affect the, the weather forecasting? Is it better or worse in either of the seasons? Uh, absolutely. Um, it is, it is mainly the, the dark period that, uh, that provides challenges. Um, again, going, going back to, uh, the, what, what I talked about in the beginning, these, um, these conditions that we face here in the Arctic during, during polar night, when we, uh, basically have no incoming sunlight. So our main energy source for a local uh, energy budget, um, is gone. Mm -hmm. And uh, on top of that, we have uh, snow and ice covered surfaces that, uh, yeah, cools the ground very, very rapidly. Uh, and uh, if we then add conditions with uh, cloud free uh, nights, for example, that we, uh, that we get a lot of radiative cooling. So the ground cools radiatively. There is no clouds that could uh, absorb this thermal radiation from the ground and re-emit. So uh, the ground cools rapidly while the uh, air aloft might still be uh, warmer um, because it, it cools from the, from the surface. So then you get conditions where you have a cold, dense air mass laying in the bottom and warmer air mass on top. We call that an inversion. 
And uh, these temperature inversions, they are very tricky for the models to get right. They can be very shallow, that you that you have just a few meters of, of vertical profile, but within these few meters, the temperature changes by 10 Kelvin, for example. So uh, this, is, uh, this is very tricky for the models to get right. So these, uh, we call them stable boundary layers in in uh, in the polar night um they are a challenge for the models yeah yeah we can get back to your um what you're writing your phd on the interaction between atmosphere ocean and ice and and also climate change impacts that yeah um this is a this is a connection that we that we start to to see and to to get between these uh, observations around the fjord which in the first place, um, we talk about processes on, on timescales of, of minutes, hours um, that, that impact the local weather conditions. But um, summing that up and integrating over long timescales, of course, this has an effect on the overall energy exchange between the fjord, uh, sea and ice. And uh, Frank, in the first episode of the podcast, was talking about that uh, due to changes both in the atmosphere and in the ocean, we have more and more warm water inside the fjord and the fjord doesn't freeze that much anymore uh, during winter as it, as it used to be. So um, then we are, we are looking at conditions where suddenly the cold air masses that form over land can, uh, can interact with the warm ocean and more heat can get extracted from the warm ocean, which again uh, turns into warming of the atmosphere itself. And, and these local scale processes that we, that we observe in, in our IWIN network, they uh, taken together and, and summed up over longer timescales, they contribute to this energy exchange. And, and this is uh, what, what we are working on uh, with, with my supervisors in my PhD that we try to understand better how, how this whole fjord system acts as an uh, energy converter basically from, from heat stored in the warm water, um, how, how it flows into the fjord, what is the mechanism behind this inflow and then um, in, in ice-free conditions how it gets extracted into the atmosphere and, and what the variability actually is in, in these exchange processes and what the net effect then is for for the total energy transport uh, northwards into into the central Arctic when we talk about the sea ice loss uh, over over global scales. If you plan, say, a longest snowmobile trip to Skottita and Billifjorn, which websites, which, um, which weather sources would you check in order to have a safe trip? I mean, definitely, uh, first, uh, first place to go is Ur. Um, just the, the regular weather forecast, um, as, as you probably all do. Um, it gives, uh, our, our best guess what, what we have from, from the model forecast. We see that, uh, the, the Norwegian model behind Ur, um, performs best in, in this area. I mean, it's targeted to, to this area. So, um, that, that's really good to know. But um, additionally, I would always uh, check Windy, um, which gives you a, a good overview of the of the large scale situation. You can check if you have uh, general air mass winds moving in from the south, from the east, from the north, and that can uh, can give you a general impression. I mean, especially during winter, west and south always means warm and moist um, because there's a lot of open ocean and, and warm water uh, to the west and to the south. So that usually means more cloudy conditions and probably snow, um, while north and, and east in general means more dry as long as we have ice cover in the in the eastern Barren Sea and, and north of Svalbard, the, the air is typically dry and cold, so that is more likely to be nicer conditions um, as, as a general picture. And then additionally, of course, uh, you can check Iwin uh, for, <laughs> for some uh, measurements directly around the fjord. Um, the closest weather station to, uh, to Skottehütte would be in, uh, in Billefjorn in Narvanesse. Um, and you you get uh, information within five minutes, uh, and you can look at the last uh, last few hours to see the the evolution um, within that time to give you an indication for uh, for what you ex- can can expect when you when you go out. Yeah. Thank you very much for joining this episode, and uh, I look forward to a more uh, accurate weather forecast for Svalbard when you finish your PhD. Hopefully, <laughs> that's. Uh... <laughs> Big pressure on my shoulders now, but I will try. (laughs) Thank you.